Hello, emerging cricket fans. Welcome to another uh, EC special here. EC Live, of course, show number four. A few things to get through before we do introduce our guest for tonight. The three Ps, pod, Patreon, and poll. First of all, our emerging cricket World Cup of Kits poll has reached its final. We have Germany taking on Vanuatu in a week-long poll. Not quite halfway through that yet, but we've had almost 2,500 votes from each of you at the time of recording. So thank you for joining in on that and make sure to max maximize your voting power by voting across Twitter and Facebook. Uh, our Patreon page, the second P, make sure to sign up to our Patreon page for extended coverage of emerging cricket content. And the third P, the podcast, the podcast dropping tomorrow, Friday, local time, wherever you are. We're chatting to Chris Pierce from the Czech Republic in part two of our chat with him. We also wrap up some news from around the emerging cricket world, including the final of the Vanuatu T10 Blast. Now, there is some action going on in Europe as well. And I have, well, the ideal person to bring in to discuss all of that uh, on the continent and everywhere else. It's uh, Daniel Weston. Daniel Weston, hello. Hi, Daniel. Pleasure to be on the show. Glad to have you on. Uh, first of all, yeah, it's a pleasure as always. And as the founder of the European Cricket League and the European Cricket Network, there's a lot going on in the, in the world of emerging cricket. So bring it back to the three Ps. You have, well, more than a strong link in all three. You were one of our first patrons here at Emerging Cricket. Uh, you played in the German national team, which have reached the, the final of our Emerging Cricket World Cup poll. And you've been on the podcast as well, talking about the European Cricket League and the European Cricket Network. Um, We've had some tricky times and everyone's experienced them in, in the, the COVID world. I've seen you've been locked up in the nets training and also working really hard off the field and, and getting a lot of streams out, not only a part of the European Cricket Series, but the European Cricket Network. How's things been for you in this tricky time? It looks like you've kept yourself pretty busy. Um, yeah, thanks, Daniel. Uh, yeah, I've, I guess I've never been busier, um, to, to be honest, because, um, yeah, I, I'm, I mean, it was a time of reflection of, uh, so some things became clearer, some things became, um, you know, cancelled, obviously, with the postponement of the ECL. Um, and it was a reflection point about where does the true value lie in what we can do to try and help the game grow in, in Europe. And then literally it was like a blank canvas because everything was stopped. So then you could take a step back and say, well, yeah, I, I, what should this summer now look like? And um, I was just speaking to a lot of our ECL partners, you know, the, the countries that are involved in, in what we do. And sort of just talking to them all the time, working out how we could play and where we could play first up. And it ended up being, uh, you know, talking to Czech and then doing the ECN Czech Super Series there, um, which actually ended up starting two weeks after Finland because just the way the political um, storm sort of settled, it meant that Finland could start playing first. So we were streaming from Finland with Andrew and his team up there, um, then in Czech and, and now in Stockholm. And what's going to happen is that all of these countries will slowly unlock and, and hopefully we can be a, a part of that puzzle so that we can continue supporting them as cricket starts to being played again. Now, there was the postponement of the European Cricket League for this year. You, you've moved that forward to 2021. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but you also had yep. the European Cricket Series even before all this COVID started in Alicante in Spain. Um, and yep. the idea was to create almost sort of gala weekends across uh, the continent. Um, you've been able to sort of do that now, given, as you said, the countries have opened up a little bit, Czech Republic are doing their thing, but you've also got uh, competitions which aren't necessarily European Cricket Series events, but you're able to stream them through the European Cricket Network. You yep. guys seem to be almost, you know, the busiest around, you know, talking to Mark Lovell and Michael and Vinny about all the stuff that you guys are doing. Um, it's been, I'm, I'm sure it's been a full-time operation for a lot of you to try and get all this stuff up and running, even if it's not the competition, but simply the streams, uh, commentary, TV overlays and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. Well, it's just a fascinating time where, you know, if, if you get your, your audio, your, your, your video stream, your graphics, your scorings and things like that correct, um, then you can create entertainment. And even if it is in a, in a very different sort of venue to a full packed house, the MCG, um, you know, the, the, the discrepancy between top, top level cricket and essentially club cricket, um, you know, that that's shrinking all, all the time. So there's a lot of value to be said for putting more and more cricket um, 
stream to the world because the technology is rising and making it uh, more cost effective to do that. Um, and it's very, uh, very clear and strange uh, sort of situation now whereby it can really happen without it being in a stadium and without it being in a, um, you know, in a packed house. You know, so, so in these, uh, we, we, we like using four cameras because we think that if, with four cameras and we start to try to, unfortunately or fortunately, play from one end, which means with four cameras playing from one end, um, you can actually get enough angles to, to meaningfully read the game and, and see what the angles are and, and, um, yeah, and, and then actually watch it for longer than a few minutes because in the past, a, a one camera fixed, fixed stream, uh, for example, isn't very entertaining. It's good for the player or good for a performance coach. Um, but as soon as you have four cameras, all of a sudden you sort of tip it into saying, oh, I can sit here and watch that game of cricket unfold. And as long as the scoring is good, and then obviously the commentary has to be spot on, it means you can watch a whole game of cricket, similar like you would for uh, an Australian or a um, T20 international on, on a big, big stage. It's, it gets pretty close. Um, if you have four cams, commentary, good graphics running, um, and that's what I'm aspiring to have. So for every game that we do, uh, it turns into a thing that you can actually sit there and watch the entire game, understand, learn the learn about the players, be entertained, um, and meanwhile, that's happening. You know, the, the promotion of the game in in some strange, far away, unfamiliar countries is is happening at the same time. But we feel that yeah, the four cameras is the is the point where it goes from being um, you know the the the, the minimum um, yeah. what's it called in the in that world the MVP the the a minimum viable product to make sure yeah. that. It's, it's a game that can be taken to the world. Well, you've shown, and, and it's something that perhaps some of the power brokers in international cricket have struggled to deal with, especially with a lot of qualifying events for, for global tournaments where they haven't even been able to put a, a minimum stream up. We've seen, you know, the very high end of your TV production in the European Cricket League last year, but to sort of peel it back and to have these satellite tournaments around, to have the four cameras, it, it definitely seems to be the job, but the other issue that comes from that, and we were just speaking about this before we we came on air, he was talking about, well, now that there is a uh, vision of this and, and people want to, you know, play, say, Dream 11, play fantasy cricket, but there's also uh, betting involved as well, that there's a whole level of anti-corruption and, and the chat around those topics that need to be discussed. When you have so many tournaments going on, how tricky has it been to, to impart that message onto all the players to to inform them of, you know, what to do if if something sinister occurs or if they receive, say, a sinister approach. Yeah, it's so many points you've just brought up there. Um, and, and I, yeah, I'm having sleepless nights or sleepless thought processes about this because I really want to protect the players. And, and the players' education for anti-corruption measures or just to know how to report something if it goes on is so, so critical to everything we do here. We're, we're at this really uncomfortable juncture between amateur sport and professional sport. And you only become a professional sport by having a transition period. And I feel with, with what I want to do in partnership with the ICC and with all of the ICC member federations is I want to take you know, amateur cricket in Europe to professional cricket. But at the moment, we're in this uncomfortable phase where we're expecting amateurs to act like professionals you know, without any, any, um, any question. You know, they have to act professionally but they're not actually professional athletes. So, so it's this position at the moment where we really need to get through. Now, I, I've, I've always been a, you know, I've always, as an ICC uh, player in different events, I'd always thought, hey, why aren't you streaming this? Why, this should be streamed. These matches should be streamed. Every match should be streamed. And that was always a sort of a criticism, but now I'm learning that it's a very bold step to take games streaming on four cameras because it's one it's costly two it's um technically you know you, you need to have all the proficiencies in place so it looks like a good package um but what i've been made fully aware of is that as soon as these matches are being streamed and particularly because there's not a lot of cricket being streamed at the moment it means that betting markets will take these games in an instant whether we partner with a betting company or whether we don't um, the scores from the from the stream get taken off. Bookmakers are making markets, and therefore the games are being bet on. Um, so, so we can't stop that. I want to promote the game of cricket. Um, the ICC wants to promote the game of cricket. We all want to promote the game of cricket. Um, but for me, the the absolute critical thing is that the players are educated um, of what an approach looks like and how to report the approach if if it comes by. 
because I and the ICC or anyone who's involved in trying to promote cricket, um, we want to promote, we want to show the game. And, and therefore, I, I don't want to say, ah, okay, we're going to do everything, but we don't want to stream it because that means the games can't be seen and no one wants that scenario. So yes, I and everyone else in sport want to be streaming and broadcasting their favorite sport or, or cricket, um, but it just needs to be done with a very, very mindful piece of, of the education to the players and the people that are involved um, to make sure that they, they understand the threats that occur and can be life-changing and, and not very not nice at all if they decide to accept an approach or don't accept um, uh, or don't report an approach that may have come on. So, so streaming is one thing, but the reality is that it, it, there's, there's some uncomfortable um, uh, side effects from, from streaming, which, which I'm, I'm trying to learn to do the best I can. Um, but for me, the protection of the players and the education to players is absolutely vital um, because I, I don't want to move back to a period where um, whether it's my project or other countries' projects to stream matches actually gets cancelled because anti-corruption is too hard. Um, yep. we, we need, and I, know, I even hope that my message now is saying, um, if players that see this, it's so critical to be saying no, reporting or avoiding um, any approaches that may come from social media, et cetera. Um, because it's, it's not a nice, if, if there's an approach that's made to someone and they start to engage in that, it's, it's just, it's a slippery slope um, to a bit of a, to a dark underworld, which isn't where any of us want to be. The reason why we're doing this, and I hope for all cricket fans out there, is to make cricket in Europe a professional sport in the future. Now, if that takes another two years or 20 years, um, we only get there by going through the hardship now, and that is by promoting, um, celebrating and creating more activities for, for players to be playing cricket in, in Europe or in any other emerging parts of the cricket world. You mentioned it when we spoke uh, well over 12 months ago now is this ECL and everything that's branched off from the ECL has been very much a long game. You, you've talked about the generations down the track and, and making cricket the bat and ball sport, the summer sport of Europe and, and not necessarily doing it for this generation, but say, you know, 20, 30 years down the track when, when your child and, and, and other, you know, kids around the European region can play for a club qualify for the European Cricket League and, and and therefore be European champions. It's been sort of the long-term goal for you. But to go back to when we chatted just before the start of, of ECL 19, the inaugural, uh, sorry, European Cricket League, getting my ECs mixed up, how did you reflect on ECL 19, the hoopla that surrounded it? You know, for, from an Australian point of view, it was on at a really good time for us. It was primetime cricket in the middle of the week. Um, you know, for a sports-staffed country like Australia, are where you know we're basically trying to, to find anything. Um, it was on the sum, you know, during the summertime for you guys. Looking back, what were your fears? What were your, you know, your your thoughts going into the tournament? And then afterwards, after VOC lifted the trophy, how did you reflect on that particular tournament? Oh, it's a great question. It feels like a long, long, long time ago now because so much has, has moved on. So um, we essentially had 100, 104, 104 points of improvement after our two-week debrief. We had a debrief and 104 different things that we could improve on and, and we will improve on and, and, and do that. Um, T10 was an accident, to, to be honest with you. It was meant to, the ECO was meant to be a T20 event in line with, um, you know, the, the, the T20 movement. Uh, and uh, and then based on a, a thought of saying, okay, let's make the ECL proof of concept in year one, a three-day event, I just found it really hard to create a, in, a, a format of integrity to find a champion after three days. So that's when it was scheduled as T10 instead of T20. And, uh, and w what happened in that scenario was that I had, I was not sure about T10. I had pushback from some of the federations. They said, okay, Daniel, just this first year, T10, and then we'll change it to T20. Um, but what happened in that moment on the first day is all of a sudden T10 became, wow, this is the format. At the top of every hour, every hour was a new game or a new innings, uh, a new power play. This was a revelation uh, in my mind in how to mean that there was a lot of participation, a lot of teams being played, a lot of death bowling, power plays, six hitting, um, which came to life. And, and for me, that was a moment where some of the people that told me it's got to be T20 next year, they actually literally punched me in the arm and said, Daniel, T10 works. It's got to be T10 in the future. So, so that was that was one thing, um, and the the other thing was that was really special about it is that playing in other international events in in the past um, at the hotel at breakfast 
it was always you know the the, the tracksuit, the 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 chest puffed out. I can remember that as a seventeen year old playing for Western Australia, walking around the breakfast room with the New South Wales boys or whatever, <laughs> and thinking, oh, like they're all they're bigger and <laughs> bigger than me, and the egos in the room, you know. Whereas yeah. at the ECL, it was absolutely flipped on its head. Like there were guys taking selfies with Pavel, guys taking selfies with Max O'Dowd, um, guys celebrating Scotty Edwards. Um, you know, the, the guys, there wasn't a discrepancy between this club and that club. It was like an Olympics. And, and a few people told me that it felt like the Olympics meant that the teams weren't segregated. All the teams were actually together um, celebrating and learning and making friends. And so, so the ECL was more about friendships uh, and a lot less about ego. And, and I really want that to continue through because at the end of the day, we're, we're all club cricketers, whether we're test players or not. We're all, one day we were club cricketers in the past or in the future and, and club cricket is all about friendship. And, and if the ECL can continue being a little bit like a mini World Cup because there's pr almost every country in the world being celebrated uh, by someone in a team at an ECL club, uh, in a club event, and uh, so it meant that there were just, yeah, friendships or similarities or relationships that were formed or could be formed or friendships made. So it, it was wonderful. There were, there were, put it that way, there were no egos around, around breakfast or dinner in the hotel because, yeah, it was, a, it was such a friendly, friendly atmosphere. And, um, yeah, I, obviously the, the whole, yeah, the, the, I, wanted to, I wanted to do something which, which made a statement which was that, European cricket's arrived and and it's here now and it's in a shiny way and it's broadcast around the world and it's with spectacular amount of cameras and, and everything to, to make the players feel proud. Because if the players feel proud, they're going to want to play club cricket again next year. Their children are going to want to be involved in the in the club, you know, for pre-season. And, and then it starts to make it a sustainable product, and which is really why I believe in, in club cricket in, in any country in the world. Yeah, and the crucial part of that is that it is club cricket. And, you know, it's not you know franchises flying in and and playing for two weeks. It's the, the very clubs that are the fabric of the cricket in that particular nation, and the champion club qualifying into a European event. I remember hearing from Pierce Fletcher on one of uh, your shows that you know Michael McCann was doing, and Pierce sort of exuded that what you just said talked about how it was very much a, a community in and around the Lamunga area for that particular tournament you know people you know had no egos a lot of club cricketers around and it sort of I think that came across in in the production as well and just looking at how the cricket was played there were celebrations but you know the, the fair play aspect was was strong as well over the course of the three days and and people were were open they you know they talked a lot about their particular cricket I remember Ryan Campbell knowing a lot of Obviously about say the VOC players, for instance, because he worked with a lot of them in the in a Dutch setup. And Peter Saylor, who's you know the Dutch team captain, playing in in the ECL, just treating it as another cricket tournament. And just to I guess to to pick up what you just said, you know, having those players really buy into the event, it makes it a little bit easier for you, doesn't it? Because it means that everyone wants to be there and wants to be a part of of what you are trying to achieve. Yeah, so so it's it becomes a belief. It's a belief system, right? And and if if you if you become a member of a club, you become a brother or a sister of that club. You you pay your subscription fees. You go to the AGM. You nominate and vote for who your captain is, who your treasurer is, who your president is. And if they do a good job, then they remain. If they don't do a good job, then they're out. So so what happens is that it becomes it's democratic all over. Um, which means that better decisions and better people can always be in, in the system, which, which is really nice because the, the, the strength of the club is based on the common goal. And if the common goal is to win and play well and go to the ECL and win the ECL, then, then you know, that, that just makes the whole club system stronger. And if there's many and hundreds of these clubs that all have the same vision, um, every time they go to their AGM, it means that the right people hopefully are going to be involved in helping the game grow and, and take those next steps. So, so I'm I'm a yeah massive advocate for, you know the, the 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 club structure because it's got democratic constitutional rules which should be in the very very interest of the game. Whereas if there's a franchise structure, it's usually one owner who has a certain view. Then he employs a certain captain or he employs a certain coach, whatever. There's a certain view which is actually hard to change. Whereas as we all know in a club structure, the the culture of a club changes via the the that democratically elected structure that's in place. So, so, so that, that, that's what makes it great. And the other thing is that 
if you look at European football, you know, there's people walking around with with Liverpool Football Club tattoos or Real Madrid tattoos. Like when you when you're part of a club, when you love a club, it's your life. And and you not very often do you turn around and say, oh, I'm gonna go for another club. It, it becomes ingrained whether win, lose, or draw, you're there. And and in European football, you love your club, you support your club without the venue or on the broadcast. Um, but it just makes the whole camaraderie stronger and stronger and stronger. So for for me, the 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 the, the passion and the 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 pride in the badge um, is is everything, and that helps a long way compared to a franchise structure where uh, okay, so now I'm forced to love something which I only learned about you know not not so long ago. Whereas some of these cricket clubs in Europe might be 100 years old or 140 years old or, or five years old, but there's culture and history that starts growing, and when that happens, there's a lot of pride attached, and and cricket should be about pride, and club cricket is certainly about pride. And the ACL was a great level. You, you talked about, you know, teams that have had histories for well over 100 years and particularly in parts of the Netherlands and, and Denmark. But then you look to countries like Romania who, you know, appeared in that first ACL where history of cricket is a, a little bit more uh, in its infancy. To bring it forward to 2021 and, first of all, commu- commiserations for ECL 20 not going ahead in, in the current climate. Next year, you're doubling in teams from 8 to 16 uh, 15 countries with VOC uh, returning by virtue of defending their title from 2019. So you'll have two teams from the Netherlands. Now, you guys had a, a pretty tricky situation where you had all these teams qualify for the ECL for 2020. Unfortunately, the 2020 tournament didn't come to fruition. So um, it might be worth, I know it's, it's tricky, but once you explain it, it actually becomes quite clear what the qualification process will be for European Cricket League 2021 because there was the dilemma of uh, the champion team in 2020, but a lot of these countries will also have domestic champions in this year and would have been qualifying for European Cricket League 2021. So I'm, I'm sure you'll nail it better than me, but if you can explain how the qualification process goes for next year, uh, I'm sure everyone at, at home would like to know how that how that pans out. Yeah, I, I, it, it feels like a lifetime ago now as well that I had that dilemma on, on, on my plate. Um, so what happened? Well, I, I know the guys at Kookaburra, shout out to, to Cooker, uh, they're pretty happy about what's going on because they had already had all the helmets and, and pads and kit prepared in the club colours. Um, so, so, so anyway, what happened uh, there was... We sort of, yeah, there was a situation whereby we had a phone call from Lamunga Club and they said, look, we, we can't host you on that time, so what what do we do? Then uh, then my first instincts as a friendly instinct was sort of like, let's, uh, all the teams that are in for this year, let's just flip it and make them for next year. Now, as I started getting on the phone to the Federation partners, um, most of them were, you know, too nice as well and said, yeah, 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 I agree, it should be the guys from last year, it should be next year, but... If you slept on it and thought about it a little bit more, you thought, well, that was a pretty tough decision or pretty unfair decision to make in May, um, I think, or March maybe. I mean, it was late March, I guess, um, to make that decision because then it effectively kills the inspiration or the, the motivation of the domestic teams for this year. So what we decided was, okay, um, we'll leave it up to the Federation. If some of the Federations are able to play this year, then let's make them make the decision. They, they can decide if... The, this year's eventual winner goes through to ECL 21 or last year's qualified winner and this year's domestic champion have a playoff. If there's a playoff, then the winner could go through. Um, and, and we left that up to the Federation. I think that was a pretty fair way of doing it in, in the end. Um, yes, so commiserations for the teams that from last year who didn't get to participate because of the postponement, but at least then it adds a lot of spice to to the, this uh, cricketing summer in Europe, if it was to take place, um, and give the chance for this team and and last year, because it sort of wouldn't make sense if there was a new champion and then they missed out, and the guys that are going to the ECL finish fifth in this year's competition. Say, if it was a modified two month event, um, so we thought, no, 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 we we need to just take a little bit of a pause here and say, okay, let's try and find the true earning deserving winner from this year, and that may be a playoff situation for, for next year. In saying that, it looks like there's probably half of the teams already that have confirmed that they'll be in for next year because there's just not enough time uh, feasible to be able to make a um, you know a, a winner. Sorry, the phone rang. Um, yeah, to, to, <laughs> you're to, a busy to, man. Yeah. That's fine. Um, there's uh, yeah, 
there, there may just not be enough time in some of these countries to, to find the find the winner. Um, but I hope that you know modified seasons can take shape in any of these countries anyway. Um, I'm still a believer in this summer that cricket will be played in most, if not all, of the European countries. Um, and by November, that's when we'll have a date. We'll say, okay, exactly these are the 16 teams for, for next year. Yeah, it, it's a tricky one, and it'll take you know a lot of a lot of um, a lot of efforts from a lot of these countries to get their club cricket up and running in their respective countries. But at the same time, there are places where they look to be relatively over the hill in terms of um, making sure that their nations are COVID free. And we've actually seen that through some of the competitions that you've had going on, either through the ECS or through the Emerging Cricket Network in places like you know like Finland and the Czech Republic so far. 16 teams, you added um, clubs from England, uh, from Ireland and, and Scotland as well, a number of other countries as well. But England being a, a full member as well as Ireland, um, that was an interesting decision and, and one that sort of took us a little bit by surprise to have, say, a cricket club from England, not necessarily a county. It was a little bit tricky, but having Swarderston there in that competition uh, what was the idea behind that, and and how? What was it like working with with the ECB as one of the you know the heavy power full member nations for the European Cricket League? Oh, it was like working with any other federation, to be honest. That the, they they had seen the ECL. Um, we had a few video calls. That they, they want to grow the game. They want to grow their their club cricket. They, they've got around four thousand clubs in yeah. England playing cricket. So for them to then. Um, partner after I sort of proved that you know the year earlier which helps with everything because if it's just an idea on a PowerPoint it's really tough but because what we did last year in the ECL we said oh this is what we want to do again we want to uh, invite you know the English club champion for them it was like an absolute wow this is great because we can promote 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 the game and that should hopefully it's uh, if it's an uplift in in the amount of clubs or players that are keen to participate in English club cricket then we're, we're kicking goals as well um, you know, it'd be interesting to see what the growth of participants in, in English club cricket is based on the ECL. Now, it might be zero or it might be one percent or whatever. And the difference is, um, you know, it might be a 20 percent jump in, in France because of their, their growing. But relative and absolute numbers are quite interesting there. And at the end of the day, um, you know, if, if all of these countries are growing their club cricket participation base, then, then we're winning as cricket lovers and the whole sport. Uh, and the other thing is that the, the only way that the French clubs are going to get any better is if they play better teams. So if, the, if Drew, um, out of Paris, an hour out of Paris, is playing against the Irish or the English champions, I can guarantee you that they're going to be better cricketers at the back end of that, which could then flow into their, their national team when they're playing in T20Is and so on and so forth. So you, you only get better by playing better, um, you know, and, and that's, the, that's the whole basis. And and. Yeah, England or Ireland or Scotland or the Netherlands, you know, they're, it's in a T10 basis. There's unknowns, you know, the, the, the power play and the death bowling has to create, you know, winning moments of a match. And, and I think anyone can do that on their day. And, um, and learning about your game and improving your game can only be done in, in high pressure situations. So we want to put a bit of pressure on the English club champions. We want to put pressure on French club champions and then everyone should, uh, should get better at their game. And looking forward even further, uh, over the last week, you've signed up five new member nations for the European Cricket League for 2022 and beyond. I think Mark Lovell might be the busiest man in cricket media at the moment. He even apologised to us and said, look, we've sent out, I think, five press releases in the last week. If you guys want me to stop, stop. And we responded with, no, 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 keep them coming because we're absolutely loving what's going on at the moment. But trying to remember all of them. So I think it was Bulgaria, Malta, Greece, uh, Croatia, uh, Cyprus as well. I think that's all of them. I, I'm sorry if I forgot anyone, but just because there's been so many of of them coming in, um, everyone signing up and buying into it. What's the overall goal for all of this? You know, how many teams could do you think you could you know logistically have competing at you know the European Cricket League? How how is all of this going to go? Because you know we're excited to see all these teams join the European Cricket League. Um, how do you think it's going to go? And 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 what are your ultimate ambitions for the tournament? Um, well, <laughs> firstly, thanks to Mark, because it, Mark works 24, 25 hours a day, maybe 26 hours a day at some points. <laughs> and I put a fair bit of pressure on Mark to, to, hit, uh, to hit the stories. And I appreciate all the work he's doing. It's, it's incredible. And uh, yeah, he, he's been the, the, the biggest workhorse in, in, in world uh, cricket.
cricketing press. I, I'm sure I'm, I'm absolutely sure of that. Uh, so thanks to Mark for for banging these news these news articles out. And and uh, the issue is that you know I'm talking to countries. Countries are eager to join the ECL. When they join the ECL, we want to get a press release out there, and they seem to all culminate in the same in the same moment last week um, with Cyprus, Bulgaria, Greece, Croatia, and Malta all joining the ECL. So I'm, I, I've got a great great relationship now with each of those guys, and and uh, yeah, the game's going to grow in all those countries, so which will feed into the national team setup, ICC um, scorecard setup. So everything is is based as a platform to help the game grow for for full three sixty degree angle. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm dodging the question, but I'll answer it. And that, that is that there, there, there's going to be another nine countries added to the ECL for 2022. So we've got five that have been announced and there's nine that are going to be announced in the not too distant future. Uh, and another nine. Um, so which will take us to 30, 30, uh, sorry, 29 domestic champions and the reigning king uh, yep. in 2022. So whoever wins next year will get the ticket. And then another 29 countries, and um, yeah, so a 30 30 country uh, format is uh, is where we'll take it. And if, for me, you know, life or sport or projects like this are all about inclusion, and we want to include more and more and more. So to wrap things up, and you know, to talk to perhaps people living in Europe at the moment who have moved to, to Europe or given up the game in Europe and they want to reignite that fire that they have in them, that cricketing fire that I'm sure so many people have in Europe, the way that the European population sits and how many cricket fans there are in continental Europe, you know, whether it's, you know, an eight-year-old kid or a 30-year-old man trying to get back into the game. What's your message to them in terms of the European Cricket League and, and joining a club um, to wrap things up? Because ultimately the participation growth you know will will explode you know in in the wake of the european cricket league and other things and other projects going on in european cricket throughout the continent what's your you know to finish up what's your message to them you know to those who are you know contemplating picking up a, a bat and ball well it's yeah it's pretty simple if it find a club join a team uh get a bat get a ball smash it hard as far as you can <laughs> you know this is the same the same sort of story we always say i i, th I think your platform um, Daniel and Tim is is magnificent for the people that are already in the in the gang, already in the emerging cricket um, gang. We need to find ways to connect them so that more people are watching your show and connecting to it. And at the moment, I'm still convinced that there's literally millions and millions of people that don't know about your show and don't know about the ECS or the ECL or whatever. So um, the way I'm trying to do that is, you know, right now, right this moment, hopefully you're going to jump on after this is that the European Cricket Series, um, which which is partnered and sponsored by Dream11, um, who have been incredible in supporting me and my vision and all the projects that we're doing going forward. The Dream11 European Cricket Series is currently on in Stockholm. Um, and the reason why I'm doing that is because I want to ignite domestic grassroots cricket all over Europe. So if we can take the ECL as that sort of cherry on, on, the, on the cake once a year, but if we can have T10 domestic series being ignited all across Europe in every week, every weekend, all over the place. It means that it gets the gets the the, the fire burning for people to say, "Hey, I want to be a member of a club again." I, because I've just seen last week for the first time. I never even knew, but cricket's played in Stockholm and it's broadcast. I want to get involved, and hopefully that that the virality of social media somehow um, works into the screen or the mobile phone screen of someone that currently today doesn't know about you doesn't know about us, but loves cricket, but is working working their butt off as an engineer in Stockholm, originally from South Africa as a, as a cricket fan. You know, so we're still in that really early day zero phase of trying to gather all of these other cult members, which are, you know, European cricket lovers, <laughs> so, or emerging cricket lovers. And so, so we're still, we're still uh, identifying that. As soon as they see that, wow, you know, that there's the ability, then that's where they have to use the powers of Google and, and search for a club nearby. So I think the people watching this show are, are already deeply engrossed in the in the story and in the passion. But for me, it's just got to be, yeah, now going that step, the second and third degree connections um, to make the whole pie bigger um, for, for all of us and for national teams and clubs and then uh, future generations. You know, the, the, those families grow and become cricketing families in the summer and, and football families in, in the winter. And, and that, that's how it's going to happen. And, and the ECL was magnificent, but it had huge costs for the logistics and the accommodation. 
So that therefore what I wanted, but it grew the game and the awareness. So therefore I thought, well, the European Cricket Series, we partner with Dream 11 for that. Um, we can take this on the road all the time. Um, and it means that we're actually doing the same as what we did for the ECL, but in a way that takes out the costs of logistics and, and accommodation. So, so it's, a, it's a huge thank you to Dream 11 for, for helping me do this. And that is to turn, instead of a one week ECL event, it now should turn into a 52 week of the year promotion of European cricket. So, um, so that, that's, that's how I think we're going to find more members and more cricketers uh, all, all across the continent. Well, thank you for keeping us on our toes here at Emerging Cricket with all the cricket going on in Europe. And to everyone out there, you know, if you search, you know, the European Cricket Network on YouTube and even on, on your website, there's always going to be cricket on basically 365 days a year almost. So a lot of people out there who have been starving for cricket and live sport have been, uh, well, they've been satisfied with the, the stuff that you guys are putting out. So thanks, you know, so much for joining me, but also promoting the game um, for everyone out there. Yeah. Like I said, make sure to look around the European Cricket Network uh, for lots of events going on. There's still stuff going on in mainland Europe um, this week and, and there will be for you know the foreseeable future. So once again, Daniel Weston, uh, thank you for joining me on the pod and uh, I'm sure we'll hear from you very, very soon. Thanks, Daniel. If, if I could just get, have a, have a yeah, two more plug. Um, yeah, so, so, so the Dream 11 European Cricket Series is on right now on your screen. So if you go to ecn.cricket, um, today is Super Thursday, six matches on today. Tomorrow is finals day, you can enjoy. Um, Saturday and Sunday, we're in Prague for the ECN Czech Super Series. Um, it's live around the world on FanCode or on the European Cricket Network, uh, FanCode if, if, if you're in India. Um, next Monday is an absolute special day for us. Uh, we're in Switzerland, um, the Dream 11 European Cricket Series St. Gallen. Uh, that's going to be seven cameras and LED boards. And thanks to our CEO, Roger Feiner, he's created uh, a Swiss masterpiece uh, that's going to happen there. Um, we essentially, in our calendar right now, we don't have a day free without cricket being streamed on the European Cricket Network or, or fan code uh, until mid-December. So oh, I'm wow. looking for a place to continue playing in December. But uh, otherwise, if you want to watch cricket, uh, if you want to help grow the game, um, take it from me that we're going to continue to improve the quality and production and and everything that we're doing um we're learning and we'll try and improve and get better step by step day by day um but um but yeah absolutely wonderful to be in partnership with emerging cricket for um for everything that we do and the friendships yeah very well taken and, and appreciated yeah glad to be a part of it and uh with our podcast dropping tomorrow we talked to chris pierce from the czech republic who will also be talking all things czech cricket and european cricket series so if you do find that rare uh, part of your day where there is no cricket on. There's also the podcast there. In terms of December, I'm not sure where you guys are going to go in continental. You might have to go fully Mediterranean for that. But once again, Daniel, fantastic to have you on. Uh, thanks for being a part of the Emerging Cricket uh, Patreon setup as well. You know, we're more than grateful for that. Um, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll speak to you very soon. Thank, thanks very much, Daniel. And yeah, you, you're right. Um, you know, with uh, Gibraltar or Malta or uh, Cyprus, there's ways to play cricket all year <laughs> round in Europe. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's where we'll be supporting and that's where we'll be. <laughs>